Um, it is Thursday, February 20th, 2020. So it is 02202020. A unique date to remember. I am uh, again just west of uh, Abilene, Texas. I'm in Merkel, Texas. It's windy outside. Otherwise, I would have done the broadcast outside, but when there's 18 mile an hour winds, gusting down the plains, you can't really hear a Facebook Live. So welcome Tina Marie Kirkpatrick from College Station, Texas, formerly from Columbia City, Indiana. Welcome Michelle Gelati, Michelle Luker, Stacy Harden, Holly Sheldon. Welcome, 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 welcome. So um, yeah, so in fact, tomorrow, I'm hoping I can go out tomorrow uh, because there are some mountains that I would like to climb. Um, but my host couple that I'm staying with has told me that they have cougars, cougars around here. And that uh, he said that one guy was out hunting deer and this deer started to run and he was up on high. And um, the deer was running as fast as it could. The cougar took like three giant leaps and then pounced on the deer and scraped it and killed it and it was gone and it scared the guy that was the hunter so much he's like i'm not doing this <laughs> he said i will not be out here with cougars so they have cougars they have panthers they even have bobcats around here and uh, of course i like to go for walks so tomorrow i'm going to try to venture out outside if it's not too windy and it's not supposed to be and then maybe i can can do my facebook live from the top of a mountain or maybe as I'm climbing and we just pray that the cougars and the bobcats and the panthers don't <laughs> come out and visit me so anyway I, I do like adventure I have an adventurous side that uh, again when I was up in uh, what uh, Yellowstone and stuff I saw or, or actually Grand Tetons um, I saw the uh, three grizzly bears and they came out to play so that was fun anyway so I was near my car so I could jump back in so last night I attended uh, Fountain Gate Merkel Church. Um, Larry Tolliver had actually done the teaching and got to see Pastor Dewey Hall. I'll be speaking there Sunday morning and Sunday night, doing a soul wound healing deliverance on Sunday morning and then doing a prophecy night. Um, it's, it's, I love to do prophecies because the Lord is, or, or speaking words from the Lord to people, because the Lord's actually been turning up the volume and specificity to me as well, to be able to speak into people's lives. So love doing that. Uh, tonight, I'm going to jail. Ah! You probably never ever guessed or thought that I would ever have to go to jail, but I'm going to jail tonight. Yay. Doing some ministry in prison and i um, going to be doing some soul wound healing and deliverance inside the jail, inside the prison. So obviously that's needed everywhere, but especially with people who have been hurt so deeply that they're having to serve some time. So looking forward to doing that tonight. Uh, with the pastor and with Larry. And the, this came, got scheduled uh, next Saturday, February 29th. I'll be on uh, a radio station in Seattle, Washington, 8.20 a.m. Um, from 8 to 10 p.m. They're also broadcasting, I think, in Chicago and other places. So that is February 29th at 8 uh, p.m. Pacific time. It's also the website is called thewordseattle.com, all one word, where you can actually listen to it. And again, you can find this on the events with Facebook. Um, Restored to Freedom is my ministry, so you can find them there, all the events, as well as uh, on my website, restoredtofreedom.com. And also, this just came in, going to back to Las Vegas. Remember, I was there last year. When was it? Do know it would have been it would be like the end of May I believe because I know in June I went to Phoenix and fried because it was so hot in Texas or in, in Arizona so anyway I'm coming back to Las Vegas March the 28th that just got scheduled I don't know a couple hours ago um, so we will be going back there and doing ministry and last time I was there I was it was it was very um, it was it was great, and then the Lord gave me words for people that came, and I uh, got to be connected to some people too that um, had been connected to Donald Trump. So um, so cool. I'm going back to Vegas uh, March 28th, 
And again, this, this weekend I'll be at Fountain Gate Church in Merkel. Next weekend, the 28th, February, I'll be in Journey U in Houston, Texas, 7 p.m. Friday night, and then doing the radio station thing on Saturday. And then March 1st, I'll be at Cool Church, Houston, Texas. Again, that church has a lot of people there that have been to jail and prisons and have done drugs and so forth. They, 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 they target those people and they actually do ministry, um, very powerful ministry. So I can't wait to go back there, Pastor Boyd Harrell. That's called Cool, C-O-O-L Church. March 7th, I'll be in Tucson, Arizona, Full Gospel Businessmen. March 10th, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, the Yada Group, which is a private group, you can't go to that. So uh, March 14th, though, you can go to a home meeting in Phoenix and da, 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 Las Vegas, I'll be March 28th, Anaheim, California, Ecclesia Global, March 29th, a Sunday night. And then April 4th, I'll be in Ojai, California, which is northwest of LA at Bread Broken Ministries. And then looking to come to Portland, Oregon the last week of April. And I'll probably have some additional venues in California in April. Then coming to Seattle, May 1st through the 3rd, a big conference there at the Point Church. Um, it's a Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Also a radio station there I'll be on. And then Billings, Montana, May 15th and 16th at Everlasting Covenant Congregation. Uh, Gillette, Wyoming, May 22nd, 23rd at Ramada Inn. Yay, 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 looking forward there. Danelle Powell has got that set up. Uh, May 24th, Open Door Church in Gillette, Wyoming. And then July 19th in Sandusky, Ohio, Eagles Nest Church. All righty, all that taken care of. Again, you can go out to Restored to Freedom on, on Facebook and you can click on Events and you'll be able to see it. In fact, they just po um, posted my latest schedule on Facebook, so, and it has the link to the uh, events there, so um, there you go. All right, so today we're talking about a subject that a lot of people have to deal with. You know, we get wronged, we get hurt. Sometimes we get wronged and we're wrong. Can that be possible? Yes, if you have wounds from your past you've not been healed from yet you get triggered you could be jealous you could be um, a myriad of, of things and then you end up harming your relationship and, and ends up the person needs to part because there needs to be healthy boundaries and stuff set up so that can cause you to get ticked off and mad and then you want to take things into your own hands you know that's called vengeance so I'm going to talk about the dangers of taking vengeance into your own hands. Vengeance. What does vengeance really mean? It means punishment inflicted or retribution exacted for an injury or perceived wrong. So again, if you think you've been wronged, you want to pay them back. The enemy, so the enemy works both ways. The enemy will oftentimes cause a person to wrong us, hurt us, and then we want to hurt them back. We want to pay them back because the enemy is like speaking to both parties. You know, that is very, very common. Oftentimes in relationships, marriage relationships, oftentimes a person that has been wounded deeply ends up hurting a person. They can't help themselves. They're hearing the voices of the enemies and demons. And when they go off on a person, they think they're right. And yet they're wrong. And so then the other person, you know, if they're hearing the enemy, they're going to be mad and they're going to end up getting into a huge org argument fighting, striving, and uh, bad stuff happens. So what does the typical pattern look like? The typical pattern is oftentimes the person could be jealous um, or they can take an offense or they can do both, but that's normally kind of how this pattern starts. And I'm gonna actually be talking about a Bible story, Saul and David, where that happened to Saul. He was jealous of David and it didn't go well for him when he tried to take things into his own hands. And um, so jealousy, offense, and then what will happen is there's unforgiveness that will happen. So you will be offended, you won't forgive the person, and then it, the demons then start driving you. Well, then I'm gonna, mm, I'm gonna get you back for that. You have bitterness that comes in now at that point, a root of bitterness that starts to grow. And then vengeance is mine, <laughs> you hear the enemy tell you, instead of the Lord. Now, those who try to take vengeance to hurt those they are angry with will have consequences. That's why it's so important to not take 
all this, to take vengeance upon yourself to try to pay someone back, try to get people to gang up, to hate. It's so wrong. What happens to a person when you end up wanting to take vengeance upon yourself and try to pay a person back? Number one, it's gonna skew your perception of reality because your demons are talking to you at that point. You will have like an alternate personality that will come up and you will not remember things correctly. You will, it'll skew and, and, and make you believe that everything that you are saying and doing is right when it's not, it's wrong. And it can skew you and it can, it can screw you up. And it, and it does, you know, and it causes you to have such an anger and hatred in your heart that there's a whole bunch of other stuff that happens. Um, it'll also cause you to not be able to sleep well at night. You uh, eventually will start to show signs of exhaustion and being exhausted and tired and worn out. It'll show up on your face. Um, you will have the inability to make wise decisions. You will make knee-jerk, stupid reactions and bad decisions, you know, and then you'll be after the fact thinking, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why did I? Oh my gosh, that was dumb. That was really dumb. Of course, you may not say that because the enemy's gonna tell you not to. Everything you do is right. Everything you do is perfect. Get them. Um, it'll often, often lead to sickness in your body, uh, diseases, neck pain, back pain that you can't get rid of. Um, oftentimes, it affects your finances negatively um, that you cannot stop because the Lord is going to address you if you start to say, I'm gonna take this into my own hands, I'm gonna pay them back, I'm gonna get them. The Lord's like, seriously, all right, well, we'll do this. And so oftentimes you may have some things uh, problem-wise that you cannot fix, you cannot stop. It could be things in your home that break down, it could be your car, automobile, it could be a myriad of things. Um, could have water leaks, flooding, things like that, that the Lord's trying to get your attention to say, stop knock it off. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, not you. Uh, back off. Um, it'll also have, you'll have relational issues because what will happen is you will want to have other people, again, to gang up on your victim because now you are the perpetrator, even though maybe you thought out, thinking, started out that you thought you were the victim, but now you've turned full circle into the perpetrator. Um, so you will try to lie and tell other people things to turn them against your victim. And uh, you will not listen to sound advice. You get stupid. <laughs> You're like, I'm not listening to anybody that's going to disagree with me. And you'll block people on Facebook that are trying to speak life and wisdom into you. Because now you've got your demons working in you and they will attract you to other people with demons that will try to like familiarize spirits, love each other. And then they're like, yeah, let's all burn this person and hang them because of what they did. Um, it consumes you, you know, you can't really have peace in your life when you're going through this, when you're trying to take out vengeance on someone. Um, and oftentimes the truth will be exposed about your anger, your hatred, lies, and you'll lose friends, lose godly friends that could have otherwise spoken into you saying, I wouldn't do that. You need to listen to the Lord on this and not take it into your own hands. Um, oftentimes your own family will start to pull back from you and not support you. Um, you know, because we can't, we can't support hatred. We cannot support that. We cannot support evil and lying. Um, you'll have increased fear and anxiety in your life. Again, it confuses your mind so much that you could blame everything, and you probably will, on your victim. Blame, 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 blame game. And, um, and in relationships, oftentimes we see that developing into where it becomes a divorce. is because the person's so consumed with and blinded in their own eyes, thinking everything wrong in, in their whole history of life was because of one person. And it's just, it ruins you. You're blinded, you cannot see. And then at that point, you're under a curse. And oftentimes, they get more blessed. And you're like, ah, I'm so mad. <laughs> They're more blessed, you know? And, um, and oftentimes, again, you, you, you take wounds and you victimize those wounds and uh, act like you're the victim when you're not. Um, and ultimately, it could cause you in your life to have your life ended prematurely um, if you'll not repent and ask for forgiveness. Revelations 2.22 talks about Jezebel, Jezebel, um, that he'll, God will put them on a sickbed 
and kill their children. So, so anyway, what does the Bible say about all this vengeance stuff? Romans 12, 14 through 19. It says, bless those who persecute you. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Now that's probably pretty hard for most of us <laughs> to do. If a person's really being bad to you and they're trying to destroy you, oh, I'm gonna pray blessings on them. <laughs> you know, that's hard to do. But that's what it says here in Romans 12, 14 through 19. So again, oftentimes we have, again, a perceived that we've been done wrong and we're not in the right space and we're the one that's wrong. And so you can imagine if we get mad and angry at someone and wanting to curse them, curse is gonna come back on us. So what we're supposed to do for those that we feel have done us wrong is to bless them. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things. High things are prideful things. Again, pride will block us, so we cannot see the truth either. But associate with the humble. There you go. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. There you go. So if you are driven by such an anger and retribution and vengeance, demons have legal right to torment you. You will not have a peaceful life. You will have a mess in your life. And the enemy wants you to be messed up. He wants you to blame everything on your victim. So it says, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So right there it is. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple, but it's hard to do. When, you, when you're hearing the voice of the enemy and you're so driven you want to kill that person, you have a spirit of murder that can come into you. That's why a lot of people murder people and kill people. Of course, a lot of times people want to do that on social media. <laughs> they want to murder and kill their victims. So that they view as, I don't know, bad. And because uh, they're hearing the voice of the enemy telling them that's bad, that person was bad. You know, and when they may have put up a healthy boundary and then you are crossed it, so you are in the wrong. Also, Deuteronomy 32, 35 says, vengeance is mine and uh, recompense. What does recompense mean? Recompense means to make amends for loss, compensate. So vengeance is mine and compensation. Their foot shall slip in due time for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come hasten upon them. So again, if you give it to the Lord, let the Lord deal with them, he will do it perfectly. And oftentimes you can pray for them, you can pray for them to be blessed. You know, oftentimes I'll pray for the, their person's soul, which has been wounded, their mind, will, and emotions, to be blessed. I, I, I pray specifically, let the soul be healed from the wounds from their past, so that they can see the truth because they have an alternate personality that comes up right then and they're very angry and that alternate personality full of demons causes them, convinces them that they are right and that everyone else or whoever didn't do what they wanted them to do is wrong and they come after them, wanna kill them. So my good friend, Christian psychologist Dominic Herbst, which a lot of you that follow me have watched a lot of his teachings, he has a, um, a thing called the cyclical destruction of the soul. And again, I'm gonna read through this. I'm not gonna show the diagram. He has a diagram that's really cool how it shows it, but I'm gonna go ahead and walk through this. So this is how it typically happens. As a person takes an offense, they're offended. They could feel like, like, like they're betrayed. Luke 17, one says, then he said, Jesus said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. You know, the woe to us that receive the offense, that get offended, Again, my friend Robia Scott, her husband James said, when we are offended, we are the ones that are off and we put up a fence. That's offense. We are the ones and we get, oh, oh, I've taken offense. I'm off and I put up a fence. And that's so good to remember. So don't take an offense. And then we have feelings of rejection and anger that will start. Ephesians 4, 26, 27. 
Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So oftentimes, again, we can get jealous. We can feel an offense. We can get betrayed. And then we have feelings of rejection and anger. And when that comes in, you now anoint yourself as a victim. I'm a victim now. I'm a victim. Oh my gosh, I was taken so advantage of. I am so... Oh, poor me, poor me, poor me. I'm a victim. I'm a victim. And you just want to shout it out on top of the mountains. And you're so happy <laughs> to say, I am a, such a poor, poor, pitiful me. I'm a victim. Please feel sorry for me. And then what happens is your soul at that point, you know, you have toxic emotions that start coming out at that point. Your soul is wounded as you feel like you've been hurt. And then you have a loss of trust for that person. Again, it could be perceived. All this could just be perception that's been skewed, which then screws us up from reality. So we perceive that we've been hurt. And then Jeremiah 17, 5 says, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. So we need to have our trust in the Lord. So our soul goes from being wounded and feeling hurt to now being infected with hate. That's when the demons start to have legal right to come in and start to call, call, tell you and call the shots and say, hey, I'm a victim, I'm a victim, I'm a victim, I'm a victim. Feel sorry for me. Hate my person that didn't do what I wanted them to do. I'm gonna to start to tell lies and manipulate and not ever divulge the truth of what I had done. And then that causes people to join in. Yeah, let's all take them down and just try to kill them. <laughs> so it blinds you once you've started to have hatred in your soul. You know, it causes your tones to change. And that's 1 John 2, 9 through 11. And then the root of bitterness now comes up. It has legal right. So you have such a bitterness in your heart. And you're not going to get set free and delivered yourself when you've got bitterness still in your heart. How can you tell if you still have that? Well, you might be posting things on social media that elude to the person that you are mad at and angry at. Well, or you may call people and you say your side of the story, you never, and you lie, um, but you have bitterness and anger and it doesn't go away. Well, that's gonna infect you. You're gonna get sicker and sicker and sicker with that um, in, a, in, in a myriad of ways, not just physically, but your whole life essentially is being driven by bitterness and hate. It says in Hebrews 12, 14 through 15, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled. So that's the goal of the enemy, is to hurt us, get us to get mad, get us angry, and then have a root of bitterness to start coming up. So that at that point, it can then continue on in its destruction of your soul to where you want now, you go into vengeance mode. Vengeance is mine. And you're like, mm, I'm going to get them for this. I'm going to really turn people against them and trying to hate them. Oh my gosh, this is going to be so fun to pay them back for how I felt hurt. So when you go into vengeance mode, you have external rage and internal fear. Um, and you start doing behaviors that are regrettable at some point. You're like, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Oh my gosh, oh, that was a really dumb decision. Maybe like years later when you finally realize that. Um, but your soul then starts to die because now you wanna harm the person. You have unforgiveness in your heart, Matthew 18 through 32. You have murder in your heart, 1 John 3, 15. You now become the offender. You are now the perpetrator. You are now the bully. You are now the abuser. And you have no compassion. You have nothing but anger and hatred that you wanna take out on your, on your victim at that point. You have contaminated thoughts that are from demons. You are now cursed and tormented. Cursed and tormented. James 3, 8 through 10. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men. 
who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. 1 Peter 3.12, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So once you have changed and gone full circle, where you are, you know, you have no empathy, you have no compassion, you view yourself as a victim, you feel like, oh my gosh, I was wounded so bad. Well, now the face of the Lord is against you because now you're doing evil. You are trying to pay a person back. And that is, um, you're on, on thin ice because the Lord will step in and he will correct you and things will not go right for you and you will make really bad and stupid decisions. First John 2.11 says, but whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. So at that point, you've got such anger and hatred inside your heart. You're hearing from demons. You have a different personality. Again, you try to act like you're still sweet and nice to those that will listen to you. But if people knew who you were behind closed doors and saw how you behaved and what was in your heart, which God sees, God's going to essentially take some action now upon you. 1 John 3.15, whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. There's a lot of people that are in the church that have murder in their hearts, have such anger and vindictiveness and vitriol for people that have either perceived to do them wrong or have done them wrong. And so what they do is they get sicker and sicker themselves. It's like they're drinking poison, hoping that that poison is going to kill their person that hurt them, and it doesn't. So... You know, if you have a person who hates you and is bitter, then you'll oftentimes recruit others through lies that you'll tell about your victim to hate them as well. This is all demonic and you should never participate in any of it. If you do, things will also affect you because now you are taking the offense from them and then you will end up getting bitterness and anger and hatred inside of your heart for them. And man, it is not healthy. I'm gonna read about this, what happens? Um, so, uh, so what should you do? Let's say that you're a victim of an attack and someone's coming after you, they're lying about you, maybe they go on social media. What should you do? Should you respond in kind and try and defend yourself on social media and go back? A lot of people do that. A lot of spiritually immature people do that. And I'm trying to bring everyone up higher and saying, we're above that. We're not gonna go that way. God doesn't want us to do that. We want to pray for them, obviously. Um, and, and it's, hard, it's not easy, it's not easy whatsoever. So do not take it to social media. Let God fight the battle for you. You know, usually the Lord at some point will release you to maybe sharing the actual truth with some people that you can trust. Um, that's kind of how the truth eventually gets out because they always say the truth rises to the top and it does normally. Again, it's those people that don't want to believe it or not. You know, oftentimes they are the same mindset, same demonic spirits that are on them are on those that are trying to take out vengeance and so forth. But the enemy will oftentimes have their hand exposed and they'll usually overstep their bounds. Then the Lord steps in for his correction. Um, Psalm 62, five through eight says, my soul wait silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. You people. <laughs> you people, trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. So that's the challenge is those that are very driven by vengeance and so forth, they can't trust God. They cannot trust, they don't hear from God. They think that they do, they act like they're a Christian and so forth, but they're not. You can see it by their actions. And then this, uh, 1 Peter 3, 12 through 20, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope 
that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, have you ever had anyone do that? They, they, they tell people that you're an evildoer when you're not, when you're doing what the Lord has instructed you to do. Again, those normally that do that still have not got their soul wounds healed yet. They still have anger and bitterness from people that have hurt them from way back when, and they're hearing the voice of the enemy, and they want to come after you and attack you. All right, so um, it says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revel your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Amen. You know, if you know that you're doing good, if you know you have a clean conscience and you're doing what the Lord has instructed you to do, and, and then obviously persecution and stuff comes against you, at least you know that God is for you. And, and it won't last forever. The Lord will change and shift things. Those who are doing evil under the guise of the Lord, not good, <laughs> not good for them. The Lord will take action upon them. Um, so he goes on and says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to, good, to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient. When once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Can you imagine Noah and all the ridicule that he faced, and then all those people eventually died? You know, just think how many years it took him to build that. But he's being mocked and mocked, and he's doing what God is telling him to do, not doing anything wrong, but people are laughing and mocking. So when people laugh and mock you, or they scourge you, or they're angry, or they send you evil messages, but you're doing what the Lord has told you to do, what, what you need to do is to simply stand. You know, and oftentimes you don't even respond back. You don't defend yourself. God will defend you in due season, in time. So here's an example in the Bible of a person that you don't want to be like, who was jealous and then was vindictive and had vengeance in his heart, and it turned out not well for him. I'm going to read the story of Saul, Saul and David. This is 1 Samuel 18. Saul resents David. It says, Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant, because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David, with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now it had happened as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women had come out of the, all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. So at that point, when that is said, Saul had the choice to make. Either he could just let it go, give it to God, and say, you know what, it's true. David is amazing. David is really anointed, and, and I wish him well. Praise the Lord for him. He's really helping protect us. Or he could turn to the dark side and get jealous and get angry and let the demons have legal right to start tormenting his thoughts and cause him to go mad and try and kill him out of his jealousy. So we all know which way that he decided to go, but he had the choice. So it goes on. It says, Then Saul became very angry, and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? 
So Saul eyed David from that day forward. So at that point, he was mad, he's ticked off, he's jealous. And you see, jealousy has a large part in a lot of the vindictive behaviors and vengeance that people want to take on others. They're jealous and they can't stand it. They, oftentimes people are jealous of people and their anointings. And while they didn't even know what it cost them to go through in order to receive the anointing of the Lord. They could be jealous, again, if you're married to someone and someone's you know, commenting to a, a person of the opposite sex um, innocently, and people can be jealous of that because of insecurities in their life from things in their past. So there's a myriad of ways, but um, jealousy is a huge part of what we have to keep out of our lives. You know, and um, so anyway, it says, and it happened on the next day. So the very next day, it says the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand, as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. Okay, now he's got a little uh, anger inside and hatred and bitterness, don't you think, in his uh, heart. But David escaped his presence, not once, but twice. Now Saul was afraid of David. So fear normally comes in. You know, when a person's being tormented and they're angry and they're vindictive and they have vengeance in their heart and they have hatred and murder, they oftentimes have fear that always accompanies that. So it says, now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him but had departed from Saul. So again, if you are jealous of another person, say they're in ministry, could be your spouse, and you start to attack them, and you wanna kill them, you wanna destroy them, you wanna destroy their reputation, you take it upon yourself to do all that stuff, you better be afraid of the Lord because you are on <laughs> thin ice at that point, and it will not go well for you when you do that. You must give them to the Lord and not let it drive you like it did Saul. So it says, therefore, so again, Saul removed him from his presence and made him captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved wisely in all of his ways. And the Lord was with him. Therefore, when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him. So again, if you have a person that's angry at you, jealous of you, hateful towards you, behave wisely. Don't try to pay them back for what they're trying to do to you. Ignore them if you can all possibly do that. You know, Seek the Lord. Do what the Lord is telling you to do. Do what the Lord is calling you to do. Don't let the demons in them persuade and dissuade you from doing what God's calling is in your life. And this is speaking to a lot of you right now watching this live and in, in, in the future, is a lot of you have callings on your life and there are people in your life right now that are trying to come against you and shut you down and stop you from that. Do not allow it. Be more afraid of the Lord than the demons in them. Do what the Lord's calling is. You will be blessed. They will probably be cursed by the Lord until they can actually humble themselves and see in the mirror at themselves and take responsibility and repent and ask for forgiveness. Because again, the enemy will take them and blind them so they cannot see it. So behave wisely and then your enemies will be afraid of you. Of course, they may still hate you more because they want to kill you and destroy you, but behave wisely. Do what the Lord's telling you to do. Even though it's hard and they're gonna push your buttons. If you have to, block them. <laughs> if you have to, shut, don't communicate with them. Because again, they're gonna to try to push your buttons, push your buttons, so it's healthiest to have no contact until they can see the errors of their ways. Second Timothy 2, 23, 24. Servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle in all their ways in hopes that they'll actually see the errors of their ways and come to the repentance that they need. So if God will indeed grant that. So anyway, but all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. Okay, again, this is um, 1 Samuel 18. It says, now David marries Michael. I'll call it Michelle. <laughs> it's M-I-C-H-A-L. Michael's just too much of a guy's name, but uh, we'll say it's Michelle. Michelle. 
Then, then Saul said to David, here is my older daughter, Merib, M-E-R-A-B. I will give her to you as a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, let my hand not be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. Yeah, what a great plan. Let somebody that's on the enemy's side kill him. That way he'll look all good. Again, the Lord knows his heart. His heart's wicked at this point. So David said to Saul, who am I? And what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? But it happened at that time when Merib, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was actually given to Adriel, the Maholathite, as a wife. Now, Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. So Saul said, I will give her to him, that she may be a snare to him. Wow, how nice of a dad is that? You can have my daughter, and she's going to snare you. Oh, so sad. Anyway, um, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him, he says. Therefore Saul said to David a second time, you shall be my son-in-law today. And Saul commanded his servants, communicate with David secretly and say, look, the king has delight in you and all his servants love you. Now therefore become the king's son-in-law. So Saul's servants spoke those words in the hearing of David. And David said, does it seem to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law? seeing I am a poor and lightly esteemed man. And the servants of Saul told him, saying, in this manner David spoke. Okay, this is verse 25. Then Saul said, thus you shall say to David, the king does not desire any dowry, but 104 skins, you, of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. So again, he's trying to get him killed getting foreskins of the Philistines, gross. So when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to become the king's son-in-law. Now the days had not expired. Therefore David arose and went, he and his men, and killed 200 men of the Philistines. And David brought their foreskins. Ew. And they gave them in full cap. Can you imagine even, can you imagine doing that? That's so disgusting, that is so gross. Ew, gives me the willies. David brought their foreskins and they gave them in full count to the king that he might become the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave him Meshal, his daughter, as a wife. Thus Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Meshal, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was still more afraid of David because, of course, he lived. He didn't die. Ah, so Saul became David's enemy continually. Continually, he hated David, went into war. And so it was whenever they went out that David behaved more wisely. Again, David behaved more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name became highly esteemed. Again, you want to make sure that you're hearing from the Lord, that you do what the Lord tells you to do, and you will be blessed. And again, it will cause your enemies that hate you, that are trying to lie about you, trying to shut you down, trying to uh, slander you, whatever. They're going to be madder because they can't touch you. Can't touch this. Do, 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 do. Remember that song? Can't touch this. Um, <laughs> why, why, why? No, I better not go there. The parachute pants. Uh, hammer time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, well, God's going to put the hammer time down on the enemy that's coming against you. There, there you go. <laughs> I like to have fun. I'm a kid from a cornfield, so. <laughs> there you go. First Samuel 19. In fact, I'll say this, so. <laughs> so there, <laughs> so there are, um, again, most people that follow most ministries are women. You know, most men, <laughs> for sad reasons, don't. <laughs> and, um, but uh, it's interesting because those guys that are having struggles with more of the spirit of Jezebel you know, hate me. <laughs> they don't like me, you know, and the wives are like, you should watch Nelson. <laughs> you should watch Nelson. Well, <laughs> recently, <laughs> recently, I am not a nut, Tina Marie. <laughs> Elizabeth's going to have the song in her head. Um, so recently, there have been more men that are now starting to like 
me and they're like, hey, I like him. He's kind of, I don't know, likable. <laughs> and that happened. Uh, there's a guy from Las Vegas. Uh, his wife just said, yeah, my husband's watching you and Dominic and he likes you guys. I'm like, yay, that's way better than I hate him. <laughs> um, and so, and even Elizabeth, yeah, her husband, that uh, he, he, at first he's like, really? Quit mentioning Nelson's name. And in fact, I'm gonna be interviewing a couple next week from Houston that they had their marriage saved and that guy hated me. <laughs> he did not want, his wife was watching me all the time and she was getting delivered and she wanted him to watch. He's like, no, no. And so eventually he ended up coming miraculously. The testimony was amazing. And, and it's been over two years ago, so I can't wait to, to have another interview with them. Um, so you guys can tune in next Wednesday night. It'll be a Wednesday night. Facebook Live special. Anyway, back to the story now, as I divested greatly and digressed. All right, 1 Samuel 19. Saul persecutes David. So again, Saul, again, says continually, <laughs> he looked at David as his enemy. So a lot of you, you people, us, have a person that now is angry at you and they're coming after you and they want to kill you and destroy you. They want to lie about you. They want to ruin your reputation. They want to fire you from your job. They want to ruin your life. They hate you. So they have demons. <laughs> so Saul can't get delivered. He's not getting his soul wounds healed. He's still got jealousy in him. So hey, Joe Livesey, former friend from Lafayette, now lives in Georgia. So Saul persecutes David, uh, 1 Samuel 19. And this, uh, here we go. Not, now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, my father, Saul, seeks to kill you. I'm sure David's probably like, hello, I kind of know that. <laughs> um, Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you. Then what I observe, I will tell you. Thus Jonathan spoke well of David. Now again, I'm going to stop there. Some of us have people who are like Jonathan, who have our backs, who are trusted. You could um, trust them with your life. But the enemy will oftentimes bring in people that are plants, that you cannot trust, that will try to kiss up to you, that will not have your best interests at heart, and they will do everything they can to try to destroy you. That is what can be really hard to perceive. So obviously we have to be aware of that. Who can you trust? Sometimes you may be able to trust a person for a couple of months, and you think you can trust them for your, your life, but then they were sent there on a mission to destroy you and to take you down. So sometimes it may be a whole year that they try to act like they're your best friend. And then they flip the switch and then they are becoming a different person. Sometimes it's because they don't, you don't do what they want you to do. And then they try to come after you. So in this case, David could trust Jonathan with his life. So, all right. Uh, Thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin. Just think he's, caught, he's, telling, his, um, he's telling his dad. Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his works have been very good toward you. Now, how many times do you say that to a person who's got vengeance in his heart, and how far does it get to them? If they're hearing the voice of the enemy strongly, they're basically triggered into an alternate personality. They're hearing the voice of demons, and it's really hard to get through to them because the demons have convinced them that their vengeance is justified, that they should come after you and defame you and kill you, expose you, shut you down. And of course, the Lord's hand is upon you, so all it's gonna do is anoint you more, and you count it all joy. Yay, I'm happy, happy, <laughs> happy, happy. And that causes your, your enemies to be even more angry. Ah! And it just starts to <laughs> destruct their soul, essentially. All right. Um, so, let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his works have been very good toward you. For he took his life in his own hands and killed the Philistines to get their foreskins. Ew! A hundred of them. Gross. Um, and the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. 
you saw and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? So he's trying to talk sense into his dad and it's not working. So how many times have we ever tried to talk sense into a person who's driven with such an anger and hatredness inside of them and you can't get through? It's because the alternate personality full of demons has convinced them that nope, nope, what they're hearing from is God and that they need to shut that person down and drive them into the ground and smear them and all this crap that's evil and demonic. So, <laughs> um, all right. So you can't talk sense into him. So Saul, said Saul, again temporarily, heeded the voice of Jonathan and Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. Then Jonathan called David and Jonathan told him all these things. So Jonathan brought David to Saul and he was in his presence as in times past. And there was war again. And David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a mighty blow and they fled from him. Now the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. Wait, wait a minute, did I go back? <laughs> um, I think it flipped back. Well, that is interesting. Yes, how did that happen? Um, wait a minute, let me go back here. Uh, well, maybe not. Maybe this is, you know, I think this is a different one. Yeah, okay, yeah. So we, again, uh, the distressing spirit came from the Lord upon Saul as he sat in his house with a spear in his hand. David was playing music with his hand. Then Saul sought to pin David to the wall with a spear, but he slipped away from Saul's presence and he drove the spear into the wall. So David fled and escaped that night. So again, even though you talk and try to talk sense into a person who is driven with vengeance and stuff, they can act like they're listening to you but they're not. And they still have hatred and anger in their heart. So they have not forgiven, they have unforgiveness, and, and they'll lie. They'll lie through their teeth because they can alternate between personalities of being the evil person that wants vengeance and wants to kill their victims and those that they can act sweet and nice to. So you oftentimes will be fooled by them because again, having a conversation with someone that's filled full of demons They'll make up stuff on the fly. That's the hard part of people that have demons is they'll lie. Lie, 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 where the people that are more set free and delivered are going to tell the truth and they don't lie. And so they have an unfair advantage because they can lie to people and get them to turn on their side and make up stuff about their victim to cause them to be angry and hateful to them. All right. Verse 11, Saul also sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, if you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michal let David down through a window. And he went and fled and escaped. And Michal took an image and laid it in the bed, put a cover of goat's hair for his head and covered it with clothes. So when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. Look, right there he is, he's sick. Don't look real closely though, because he's a goat today. <laughs> he's so sick, he turned into a goat. There you go. Then Saul sent the messengers back to see David. Can you get a drink of water? This is getting good now. Talking about goats, Michal. So then Saul sent the messengers back to see David saying, bring him up to me in the bed that I may kill him. And when the messengers had come in, there was the image in the bed with a cover of goat's hair for his head. Then Saul said to Michal, why have you deceived me like this and sent my enemy away so that he has escaped? And Michal answered Saul. He said to me, let me go. Why should I kill you? So David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. So again, sometimes you may have to be rescued and someone's trying to attack you and you go to someone who is anointed. That is a safe place to go to. If you go to a person that's say, not at all anointed, you know, it could backfire on you. You know, you're trying to share the truth. So make sure maybe you go to a person who is a Christian, I don't know, psychologist, or you go to someone who is, um, uh, has, has, an, has an anointing and authority that people will listen to. Um, 
you know, don't just go to, I don't know, <laughs> go to someone like uh, your kid sister or something and tell them, because what use, what can they do really for you? So in this case, he went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and stayed at Naoth. Now it was told Saul saying, take note, David is at Naoth in Ramah. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the group of prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as leader over them, the spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul and they also prophesied. And when Saul was told, he sent other messengers and they prophesied likewise. Then Saul sent messengers again the third time and they prophesied also. Then he also went to Ramah and came to the great well that is at Seku. So he asked and said, where are Samuel and David? And someone said, indeed, they are at Naoth and Ramah. So he went there to Naoth and Ramah. Then the spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth and Ramah. And he also stripped off his clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Ew, naked Saul, naked Saul. Therefore they say, is Saul also among the prophets? So you can see when you go to someone who is anointed for protection against your true enemy, well, oftentimes what will happen is the Lord's hand will be upon you and will protect you. If you go to someone that has no authority, no anointing whatsoever to try to gain protection and so forth, what good is that? So anyway, when people attack God's anointed men and women and they lie about them, it will not go well for them. God will intervene. And, and they will ultimately be halted from doing what they're supposed to do. So later on, Saul pursues David, tries to kill him, and um, twice David had the chance to kill Saul, but he wouldn't. Just think, if someone's trying to kill you, and then you end up finding them asleep, like in a cave, and you have a chance to kill them, you don't. Wow, that's quite the restraint. Um, I will say once when I went to, only time I ever went to Israel, I got to go where David hid from Saul. They had a waterfall there. You had to go, I don't know, an hour walk to get back from this local cantina by the Dead Sea. And then you could climb all the way up dangerously up to the top where there was a cave up on top where um, did that and it was dangerous. You could have died. There's only one other couple that did that out of like, I don't know, 200 people, and there's no railings and stuff. It's, it is dangerous, but man, when you get up there, you can see for miles and miles and miles all around. And I heard the Lord's, that, Lord's voice actually speak to me when I was up there, telling me about what I was gonna have to be going through in the future, and I'm like, hmm, that doesn't sound too fun, but yet he said it was gonna be worth it in the end, so I trusted him, and I've gone through some extreme stuff that's not fun, so. Next, 1 Samuel 28. Saul now, this is um, after Samuel died. So again, Saul had, had respected Samuel being prophetic and all, being a prophet. But then when Samuel died, what did Saul do? Saul consulted a medium, not a large or small, but a medium. That is not good. Don't ever consult a medium lesson need to be learned. What happens when he does this? It says, again, 1 Samuel 28. Now it happened in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war to fight with Israel. And Achish, or Achish said to David, you assuredly know that you will go out with me to battle you and your men. So David said to Achish, surely you know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, therefore I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah, in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. Not Shuman, Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together, and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid. Fear. Again, most people that are like bullying you and trying to lie about you and hurt you and come after you and have vengeance, deep down inside, 
they're in fear a lot. They have a spirit of fear on them. And they're very insecure of who they are. They don't know who they are in Christ. They just hear a lot of voices that are not from the Lord. So Saul gathered all Israel together and they camped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim, U-R-I-M, or by the prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, find me a woman who is a medium that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, in fact, there is a woman who is a medium at En Dor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes and he went and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night and he said, please conduct a seance for me and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. Then the woman said to him, look, you know what Saul has done. She did not realize it was Saul. How he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? I'll say this too. Holy Spirit, stop. So when you are in the vengeance mode, you're wanting to pay people back, you're angry and stuff, you're not in your right mind, you're hearing voices of the demons, you will do things that you normally would have never ever done had you been in your right mind, had you not had vengeance in your heart. It will cause you to do stupid things. It will cause you to go after and seek advice from mediums and witches and so forth. And you'll oftentimes align your life with them and they will influence you and you will do even worse things that you would normally would never have done. All right, let's go back here. Um, then the woman said to him, look, you know what Saul's done, how he's cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swore to her by the Lord saying, as the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul saying, why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, what is his form? And she said, an old man is coming up and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed for the Philistines make war against me and God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore, I have called you that you may reveal to me what I should do. Then Samuel said, so why do you ask me seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? So see, if you have anger and bitterness in your heart for someone and you don't get that and let that go, you don't forgive them, you know, you don't pray for them, love them from afar if you have to, guess what? The Lord will depart from you and bad things will happen to you. It says, and the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. What does that mean? You'll be with me. That means he's going to die. That's why you can have a premature death if you choose to have vindictiveness and vengeance in your heart for anyone. Got to let it go. Give it to God. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Immediately, Saul fell full length on the ground and was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him for he had eaten no food all day or all night. And the woman came to Saul and saw that he was severely troubled and said to him, look, your maidservant has obeyed your voice and I have put my life in my hands and heeded the words which you spoke to me. Now therefore, please heed also the voice of your maidservant and let me set a piece of bread before you and eat that you may have strength when you go on your way. But he refused and said, I will not eat. So at that point, he's starting to be humbled. He knows his life is gonna be over. All this anger, all this hatred, all this bitterness that a lot of us have and harbor for other people in the past, you gotta give it up and give it to God. 
you got to get yourself healed, your soul wounds. Again, your wounds from your past oftentimes drive your behavior of the present and ruin your future. Doesn't matter how many times you have prophetic words spoken over you that sound really great and everything. If you don't do your part, if you don't forgive, if you don't ask Jesus to come heal your soul wounds and then forgive those people and humble yourselves, you'll never see what the prophetic words spoken over you were because you could, you could die a premature death. Oh, so, his servants, together with the woman, urged him, and he, he heeded their voice. Then he arose from the ground and sat on the bed. Now the woman had a fatted calf in the house, and she hastened to kill it. And she took flour and kneaded it, and baked unleavened bread from it. So she brought it before Saul and his servants, and they ate. Then they arose and went away that night. 1 Samuel 31, the tragic end of Saul and his sons. Now the Philistines fought, this is... Uh, yeah, 31, verse 1. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. Then the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons, and the Philistines killed Jonathan, sad, Abinadab and Malkishua, Saul's sons. The battle became fierce against Saul. The archers hit him, and he was severely wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul, his three sons, his armor bearer, and all his men died together that same day. And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those who were on the other side of the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled. And the Philistines came and dwelt in them. So it happened the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. And they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent word throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim it in the temple of their idols and among the people. Then they put his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreths, and they fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shan. Now when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and traveled all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Beth Shan, and they came to Jabesh and burned them there. Then they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree at Jabesh and fast, fasted seven days. So. The demons of destruction will come upon you if you try to come against other people and take vengeance in your own hands, especially anyone that is anointed by the Lord. You will suffer, you will struggle greatly in your life um, if you are driven to destroy those that God is using. You will bring a curse down on your life and the person that you are hating if they are doing what the Lord once for them um, and they will be blessed even greater psalms 105 14 through 15 says he permitted no one to do them wrong yes he rebuked kings for their sake saying do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm so i'm going to pray for all of us who have any type of anger and bitterness for anyone that has done us wrong, so that we can forgive them, that our souls be healed. So we thank you, Heavenly Father God. We just come before you right now in the name of Jesus for all of us who are currently struggling or have struggled in the past with people who have lied about us, who have slandered us, who have said things that are evil, that are demonic to try to hurt us. We release them today. We give them to you, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you will fight the battle for us in Jesus' name. And we, we just pray for their souls to be healed, to be restored, Lord, in Jesus' name, so that they can see the error of their ways. But we thank you, Heavenly Father God, that we will harbor no bitterness within us. We give this to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. We want no part of that. And we thank you, Heavenly Father God, that you are protecting us. You are providing for us. In Jesus' name, we declare amen and amen. 
Alrighty, well, I am about nine minutes overdue, so I will let you guys go. So, yay, don't take vengeance. Do not do that on anyone that's done you wrong. You give them to the Lord, and you stay pure in your heart. Alrighty, I love you guys. See ya. Bye-bye.